Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. The 2019 sixth annual biohacking conference featured some really amazing industry professionals and people who've used biohacking on themselves to do things that made them, well, game changers. Renowned thinkers, leaders, experts, people like that. And today's episode of Bulletproof Radio is one of those keynote presentations from the conference. I had the pleasure of interviewing Ariana Huffington on stage in front of the audience of more than a thousand people. She's a remarkable human being, a business leader, author, and she's also the founder and CEO of Thrive Global, which is an organization that's on a, quote, mission to unlock human potential. In our fireside chat, we talk about sleep, biohacking, prioritizing, performance, and a lot more. And she answered questions from the audience as well. So I'm excited today that you'll be hearing what she had to say about her journey to being where she is now, where she's happier and higher performing than she used to be. With no further ado, here's Ariana. Ariana, welcome. Now, Ariana, you were so kind. I reached out a few years ago and I said, I would like to interview you for Bulletproof Radio. And instead of saying, okay, yeah, sure, uh, or saying no, uh, you actually said, why don't you come to my studios at Huffington Post and we'll just do it there, it'll be easy. I'm like, wow, how generous and kind. So I just wanted to publicly thank you uh, for that. Thank you, it's such a good time and uh, I've loved everything you've been launching since, including my bulletproof coffee, my daily habit. <laughs> <laughs> now, Let's talk about sleep. Uh, you were in Game Changers, and your, your story's in there, but what happened to you when you didn't sleep? So I bought into the delusion that in order to succeed and build uh, the Huffington Post, which I started in 2005, and be a good mom to my two teenage daughters at the time, I had to be always on, sleep was for losers, you know, the whole thing in the culture, like you <laughs> snooze, you lose, I'll sleep when I'm dead, that whole thing. And so, two years into building HuffPost, um, I literally collapsed. I got up from my desk because I was feeling cold, I went to get a sweater and I fell and hit my head on my desk and broke my cheekbone. And that was my wake-up call. And in a way, I'm really grateful for that wake-up call, both because I think otherwise I might either be dead by now or have had a stroke or something a lot worse than a broken choke bone, but also because this now has become my mission mm -hmm. to help wake up the world to the importance of sleep, of recovery, of recharging, and realizing that actually if we want peak performance, mm -hmm. these are tools in the toolbox that we need. And we see it from athletes. Yeah. It's kind of amazing to see that the reason why Tom Brady can still win Super Bowls, and he'll say that, is because he does prioritize his sleep. He does prioritize unplugging and recharging. So why is something good for athletes where every Every ounce of additional performance makes a difference and not good for the rest of us. It's, it's a very fair question. And I want to ask you about mission because you've done very well with Huffington Post. I mean, you, you could retire on an island tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people ha have done that. But here you are you know, starting up Thrive and really focusing on the mission of improving sleep. What, well, sleep is, that is just one of um, eight journeys we have. Um, well, I decided to leave the Huffington Post in 2016 and launch Thrive Global, my new company, because I wanted to devote myself to these issues of basically ending the stress and burnout epidemic. That's our mission at, at Thrive Global. The stress and burnout epidemic is actually at the moment leading to horrific uh, outcomes. We have chronic diseases skyrocketing. And as you know, 75% of these diseases are stress-related and preventable. Mm -hmm. We have mental health 
problems skyrocketing, depression, anxiety, and if you add those root causes, you get up to 90% of all diseases being stress-related and preventable. There is absolutely no way that medicine, surgery, traditional healthcare provisions will be able to address these problems all around the world without us changing the way we work and live. I think that's the ultimate disruption, changing the way we work and live. And what I love, Dave, is finding unexpected ways to work with people. Obviously, going into corporations, which we are doing, and working on the cultures, and helping um, employers understand that if you want engagement and peak performance from your employees, you need to help them prioritize their own recovery, recharging, and well-being. Obviously, through our media platform that goes directly to consumers and brings them all that information and new role models and builds community, which you are so great at doing here, and also, though, with a behavior change product that can accelerate all these shifts. Because you can't scale just with workshops. You can't scale just through the media platform. You need to give people the tools to change behavior. And that's hard. Changing behavior is hard. It, it's one of the hardest things of all. It, it seems like one of the first ingredients for behavior change is hope. Like People have to believe that it's possible. And at Bulletproof, we did a bunch of research and we figured out there's this group we call the, funny enough, the Thrivers. <laughs> and <laughs> I know, it's a great name. Isn't, isn't it? it? <laughs> and, and these are the people in the room. Like, you guys have figured out some of this stuff. You, you know it's possible and you're actively doing it. But then we have this world of, of strivers. Like, I, I think it yeah. maybe, maybe sort of. And the behavior change for them is getting them to lock in on that. No, not sort of, like th this is the path. And then you have this other group of strugglers. And these are the people who really don't really think it's possible. And it feels like the behavior change is different depending on here. It's fine tuning for our friends in the right. room. How do, you, how do you get to the outer ridge, the, the, the strugglers, people, I don't even think this is possible. Do you have a recipe for that? Absolutely. So one kind of unusual recipe is to use what neuroscientists call habit stacking. And uh, in fact, uh, we are working with PNG um, that reaches through its, through its uh, brands five billion consumers a day and has much um, more amazing compliance than any behavior change app. They have like 70 to 90% compliance in the use of Crest toothpaste or Pantene or toilet paper. Okay, that's pretty good, 90%. I hope it's more than 90% compliance. But my point is that using the existing compliance rates of a powerful consumer product company to habit stack additional good, healthy behaviors on top of that can be game changing for the people who are the stragglers and the strivers. Um, there is 70% compliance of people brushing their teeth every morning and night. You don't want to be around the other 30%. <laughs> so we are adding a micro step on top of that, which is while you are brushing your teeth, think of three things you are grateful for. Imagine how that changes the way you begin and the way you end your day. And we know from all the scientific data we've been collecting, that if you end your day on a positive note, your sleep is going to be deeper and better. You know, every day is a mixture of good things and bad things happening. So you could go to bed thinking of all the bad things that happened that day, and then your brain will move into rumination or will wake you up in the middle of the night and rehearse all the bad things that happened. Or you can go to bed focusing as your last thought on the good ha things that happened that day. And so being able to do that habit stacking on top of something people are already doing, which doesn't require more time, yeah. is just one of the game-changing ways that we want to reach people where they are. It, just showing people what's possible and suggesting that habit stack can be really good. 
Now, I'm going to embarrass my wife, Lana. Now, in the morning, she read a book about habit stacking recently. So I came in a few months ago, and she's blending Bulletproof in the kitchen, doing squats while the blender's on. I hear your muscles, your thigh <laughs> muscles are amazing at the moment. Your, your, husband, your husband was raving about them in the green room. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and when I asked her, what are you doing? She said, well, I read the book. And hey, you know, when I do this, I'm doing the squats I probably wouldn't have done, and it didn't take any more time than before. So I'm going to let the blender run for a minute and just do my squats. I I'm love like, that. Can that you please write about it? Because <laughs> honestly, I would, in fact, love to invite all of you to write about it on thriveglobal.com and anywhere else you want. I was telling Dave. ThriveGlobal.com and our social media platforms are never about exclusivity. Mm. They are about distributing great information and great content. You can post it anywhere you want, but also post it with us. We have 30 million users. I want to give you my email address to make it super easy to send it to me directly. We'll give you a password, and you can post anytime you want, ah at ThriveGlobal.com. And the reason why that's so important is because we have found that what moves the needle faster than anything else is people hearing from other people in the arena mm. about what they are doing and how it's working for them. It's almost as if the strivers and the strugglers need permission from the thrivers to actually integrate these things in their lives and feel secure that that, that doesn't mean they are going to fail or be left behind. That this is not just for people chilling under the mango tree, which is what people are worried about. It's for people in the arena. I'll give you an example. We had Philip Schindler told me um, at dinner, he's the chief, Google of, the chief business officer at Google. Mm -hmm. He told me about his moment of epiphany when he came back from a long trip. He has young children. He told his children, daddy is taking you to the playground. His five-year-old said, oh, no, can't the babysitter take us? He asked why, and the five-year-old said, because when you're in the playground, you're always on your phone. Wow. So that was his moment of epiphany. He said, after that, I never take my phone when I'm with my children. I travel a lot. I'm not with them all the time. That's the least I can do. Exactly. <laughs> And then he let me know what an incredible impact that had at Google, because they heard from one of their top leaders what he was doing, and then they felt they could change their behavior. Mm -hmm. So please share with us whatever it is you are doing, because our relationship with technology also is one of the biggest um, addictions at the moment that are having a terrible impact on relationships, on a sense of isolation, and they're particularly hard for pre-teens and teens. Yeah. I, uh, I don't let my kids use that tech. Uh, they, they can listen to audiobooks. They actually have iPhones uh, with no SIM cards and no Wi-Fi. <laughs> wow. And How old are they? They're 9 and 11. That's amazing. And so well, storytelling you know, is powerful. I think that, also no. what that shows is that the more the parents understand the dangers, mm -hmm. the more careful they are. If, uh, when I go to Silicon Valley to stay with friends of mine who are at the center of the tech revolution, their children play with Legos and chickens. <laughs> and literally, at the entry, if, if you ever go to a party with them, there will be a note at the front door that says, let's celebrate in private, no social media allowed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I read an article recently in The Atlantic, and they talked about how spending time in person with others was becoming something that rich people did. I know. It's the ultimate growing inequality now. Yeah. And that successful rich people recognize that disconnecting from tech is essential for connecting with our humanity. And people uh, in lower socioeconomic brackets still think that having Wi-Fi and being connected is a status symbol. 
So we need to spread that information. Because although technology is amazing and we all love it and we wouldn't be here without it, we need to set boundaries. You know, everybody talks about AI and machine learning and augmented reality. Fantastic. These are givens. They're going to happen. But for me, the big journey we all need to go on is what I call augmented humanity. How do we tap into our humanity, into our empathy, our compassion, our ability to love and to create? These are human qualities, and they can never be duplicated by machines. Yeah. What do you think about these uh, robots for older people at retirement homes that are attempting to do that? Have you seen these things? Have you guys seen those? Here's what I want to, to see. There are going to be millions of jobs destroyed by AI. Yeah. Um, the estimate has been as many as half our jobs. Yep. The jobs that will not be destroyed is our caregiving jobs. Mm -hmm. So why not train people to actually be caregivers? And you know what is required, first of all, is empathy. You exactly. can't be a caregiver if you're not empathetic. And one of the first things that destroyed by our addiction to tech is empathy. Yes. So that's really what we need to be focusing on. And then you, you, you need real human beings also in yeah. this uh, um, nursing homes, or ho let alone it, hospices. Exactly. Replacing that kind of empathy stuff with, uh, with tech is, I, I think it's kind of evil. Well, it's not going to work. Yeah. Well, some, some of the reports are people saying, I, I feel really good that I have this robot to talk to because <laughs> of profound loneliness, but I'm pretty sure if it would have been a human being, they would have felt way better. So I, I feel like, like there's plenty of available people to do that, but the platforms for connecting with others aren't there well, yet. It's, it really comes back to what is life about. You know, I'm, I'm Greek, as you can hear from this accent. So I, I was brought up on the Greek philosophers and the Greeks' definition of a good life. And I think we need to go back to them. And it's the same whether it's the Chinese philosophers, Japanese philosophers, the Stoics, they all basically talk about the good life being the ability to access our own center of peace, strength, and wisdom. We all have it, it's our birthright. But as Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk said, it's never been easier to run away from ourselves. So connecting with that part is essential for a fulfilling life. And unfortunately, our culture has reduced the good life down to success and has reduced success down to two metrics, money and power. And in my book, Thrive, as you know, Dave, I introduced that third metric of well-being, wisdom, wonder and giving, and without all that, our life is like trying to sit on a two-legged stool. Sooner mm -hmm. or later, we fall off. And, and if you've been to any friend's memorial recently, you know, our eulogies have very little to do with our resumes. Have you ever heard anybody say, you know, George was amazing. He increased market share by one third. <laughs> And so why not grow our eulogy virtues, not just our resume virtues, throughout our lives? That, that's a powerful statement. It, when I interviewed all of those guests on, on Bulletproof Radio, uh, including you, and I asked three most important pieces of advice for performing better as a human being. Not one person ever said money, fame, or power. And that's one of the things that really stood out. So the people who are doing big things like, like you've done, that is not the focus. It's a byproduct of them you know, being happy, of them figuring out their mission and going out and, and doing it instead of thinking about it or all the other things. And I found that really inspiring because it could have easily been, you know, the secret to success is, you know, crushing the competition, <laughs> meditating on the blood of your enemies. And that, that sort of stuff, it, it's just not how it works, but it, it seems like if you watch TV, you consume, you read YouTube comments or something, it, it feels like that is the message a lot of people get. What is the best way to help 
mass, like mil millions and billions of people understand what you just said there? Well, what we are doing for that is building a platform. We've just opened an office in San Francisco and we have a great product and engineering team. We are hiring, if anybody knows, great designers, product engineers, people email me. And what we're doing is building a behavior change product that adds a lot of elements to behavior change. So far, the reason why behavior change products and apps haven't really worked is because we treat human beings like Pavlovian dogs or mice. You know, we pull a liver, we get some cheese, and human beings are complex organisms. In order to change behavior, we need to touch people's hearts, people's souls, we need to capture their imagination, we need to do what the fashion industry and the entertainment industry have done so well. So that's what we are building. How come the fashion industry can convince a woman making $50,000 a year to buy a $2,000 Prada bag? <laughs> because somehow it's essential to her well-being. <laughs> But we can't convince people to get enough sleep, to avoid eating processed foods and sugars, to move more. We need to use the same techniques, that's what we're doing, that the fashion industry and the entertainment industry is using to change behavior around health and performance. It's not going to happen otherwise. And uh, in order to do that, we need to work with behavior scientists, which is what we are doing, who understand how to move human behavior, and not just how to give people little nudges. Nudges are very important. We have nudges and micro steps, but you have to go beyond nudges to capturing people's imagination. So that's what we're doing, and that's how we think we can take what we're doing with workshops and the media platform and spread it to hundreds of millions of people. Beautiful. I, I really support your vision there. And I, I, am, uh, I just admire the fact that you're pushing on doing that and really putting your, uh, putting your power and effort and will into it. it it's, it's very noteworthy. And I believe our audience has some questions for you. You up Great. for a few minutes of Q&A? OK, who wants to go first? All right. We've got a microphone over there. All right. Uh, my name is Gareth Herman, and I own a uh, accountability team business where we support people in setting goals and tracking habits, daily accountability, um, daily calls, text check-ins to help you live your best life. Great. And so I've really been focused on this question of behavior change just in my own journey and really struggled to do things. I have a vision and struggle to take action on it, which is how I started all of this. And so I'm curious to, to follow up on your question about what's gone so well in the you know, entertainment and fashion industry. You said that those are, there's some concepts there that we can really leverage and borrow and bring that over to behavior change. And, and I'm, I'm curious to learn, just to hear a little bit follow up that of what are those essential ingredients in fashion and entertainment that we can borrow and bring to behavior change? So one of the main ingredients beyond Aesthetics. Aesthetics are important. Beautiful design is important. That draws you in. But beyond that, it's featuring role models. Um, people buy the Prada back because somebody they've seen in advertising or in social media is somebody they aspire to be like. Either a celebrity or even a beautiful, happy-looking model, although I've never seen a happy-looking model. They all look miserable. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but maybe, I don't know why they think it's more attractive to look angry and miserable, but that's another story. <laughs> so I think, first of all, I love that the accountability part. I mean, we have accountability bodies for everything we're doing. It makes a huge difference. One of the things we do, you may want to take and do as well, is when people um, start a new job, we recommend to all the companies we are working with, Accenture, JP Morgan, the Hilton Hotels, to start with what we call an entry interview. And the first question of the entry interview is, what is important to you outside of work? And whatever they say is important, we, we team them up with an accountability body 
in their own team to make them uh, actually achieve it. So we had um, someone at Thrive, for example, our own company, who said, what's important to me is every Tuesday at 7 p.m. to make my therapy appointment. And she get, had come from another big publishing company, and her manager said, well, when was the last time you actually were there on time? And she said, like, six months ago. <laughs> so we took somebody from her team, was her accountability buddy. So at 6 p.m., she literally takes her bag, her coat, takes him to the elevator, and says, you are leaving. And what is amazing about that is not just that she is actually meeting her 7 p.m. therapy appointment, but that she feels more bonding with the team. So people have all these different ways to, to create um, team spirit. Nothing is more important than supporting each other's goals, not just within your career, but within your life. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, so who's got the mic? Or oh, there's a... There's another mic. All right, let's do the other mic. We'll go back and forth. That's easy. All right. Hi. I'll do a reveal, so I won't tell you who I am until I ask the question. Do you feel we can create more blue zones on this planet? I think we should all create our own blue zone. I think we should go beyond blue zones being geographic areas and make blue zones wherever we live. Um, I guess I'm next over here. All right. Hi, my name is uh, my, hi, my name is Elias Serjan. I do uh, corporate training with a company called Business Brain, and I do a lot of behavioral change. So I wanted to ask you, with your new app and the new strategy you're doing, uh, I agree with you. People aren't robots that you just push a button. But one of the things that I found that I started to get into, in addition to biometric testing for my biohacking, was psychometric testing for behavioral change because. Different people, in the same way that different things, like Dave was just talking about our diet, not the same diet doesn't work for everybody, people are motivated differently. So I'm just wondering, with this methodology you're designing, are you going to use psychometrics to personalize the behavioral change process? Because I found that's like essential, but I don't see a lot of people doing that. It's something I'm trying to bring forward myself in my work. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, recommendations that we call micro steps have to be personalized because people respond um, to different uh, recommendations and not just giving people physical biometrics but mental and psychological and emotional biometrics is absolutely key because you can be doing everything right in terms of what you eat, in terms of how much you exercise, but if your brain is constantly ruminating or um, judging you or doubting you, you are going to end the day depleted. And I know that because I started life as incredibly self-judgmental. And I, unfortunately, I have found that women are more prone to what I call the obnoxious roommate living in our heads that constantly like puts us down, judges what we did, like literally, I, I could do this conversation with Dave and have a great time, and then I would leave the conversation, I would spend 48 hours ruminating over the conversation, saying, oh, you know, I don't think you answered that question well, and I think, you know, when you said that, you could have said that instead, which would have been much more effective, and I really don't think people connected with you, and it's like, and by the end of it, you're exhausted. You feel as though you've run a marathon. And instead of being present with whatever is next, you are in the past. And there is no good thing that ever happens in the past. So um, I feel what you are saying is incredibly important. That's why we have all these journeys that are about gratitude and connection and all the things that actually make it possible for us to thrive on a consistent basis. And the other thing that I find is incredibly important is what we call thrive time. Let me explain that. When we started hiring, you know, we are two and a half years old. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people who applied to come and work with us because we thought, they thought we were a laid back organization. <laughs> that we were like a nine to five operation. So we had to actually real, realize that 
we needed to explain to people, no, we are very ambitious. We have huge goals. The point is that we know that in order to achieve these goals, we both have to work hard, but we have to work smart. What does that mean to us specifically? Let's say you pulled an all-nighter to ship a product. You may have to do that. You exerted yourself extra hard. After that, we have what we call thrive time. Take time to recharge immediately. The problem what is when people overexert themselves and then they continue working, they either get sick or they make mistakes or in one way or another stop thriving. So thrive time is an essential concept. We're never going to have any interesting job that is nine to five. Can we all agree on that? But if we don't include thrive time, if we're not conscious of when we've overexerted ourselves and we need to course correct, then we are not going to be able to operate from our best and our healthiest and our most joyful part. Beautifully said. <laughs> we've got time for one more question. Mike's up here. Um, hi, my name is James Brown, and I'm a meditation teacher. So I have a question. In 1968, Bobby Kennedy gave a speech complaining that if everyone in the audience got cancer, it would be great for the GDP, but that it would be terrible for humans. And he said that we need a metric that can be something that can be in the State of the Union every year. Like, how are we doing? Fifty years later, we still don't have that metric. Right, so you spoke to this question, and so I would ask the both of you, what are some actual things we can measure? What would be the aggregates of data that we can pull in to create a metric, and could you be the one to publish it every year through your Thrive program? Ooh. <laughs> Absolutely, I would be delighted to. So we haven't done it here, but Bhutan did it. Yep. Bhutan is actually measuring human happiness. And now um, Fiji is doing something that we are working with them on, actually. Instead of measuring um, billionaires, they have a phrase in, uh, in Fiji that means happiness, and they call it billionaires. And so there are things happening. Even in the UK, um, they are measuring an aspect of that. So you're absolutely right. I think the GDP that we measure now does not really measure true happiness, true fulfillment. It measures a lot of externalities, as economists would say, and we need to change that. But I always believe in starting where we can, starting at the individual level, starting at the enterprise level, and meeting people where they are, because I feel that's how we are going to accelerate the change. You know, there are these countervailing forces now. The change is happening. People are fried. They know the way we've been living and working is not, is not sustainable. Um, but at the same time, there are all these other forces, especially our addiction to games, uh, to technology, uh, to social media, that's making it harder. But I want to end on an optimistic note because I believe in the end, the fact that human beings have as part of our birthright, this center of wisdom, peace, and strength means that the thrivers will prevail. Now, now since you asked both of us, I, I think we should just measure it based on the number of likes on social media. <laughs> But, okay, then you should all go after this and like on my Instagram. <laughs> Double F, the picture of Dave and me from backstage, okay? There, there you go. Uh, more seriously, this gets to fundamental issues of democracy. So we're voting for stuff, but we aren't measuring. A, a, a vote is ultimately a poll. It's a survey. And we're not surveying that. And I guarantee you that if... Politicians stayed in office based on how we responded to a survey about how much we like our life, we'd have a different group of criminals in office. <laughs> Voting is actually unbelievably important. I hope everybody's going to turn out and vote because 
The reason we have who we have in the White House now is because of the lower turnout in 2016, and we can't afford to have that again in 2020. And, and it was all psychometric <laughs> to the earlier question. The psychometric differences, we have the data now to measure these things. And I would encourage you, with the reach you've got, to, to do more surveying and, and more understanding. And maybe well, actually, you can be the one who can, who we can do just, that. We just announced, in partnership with Qualtrics, that's this amazing mm -hmm. survey company that was just bought by SAP for $8 billion, so quite a good exit for a startup. Um, we just announced um, the Thrive Index. Together yeah. with Qualtrics and SAP, we are measuring now in companies how people thrive, what are their experiences. Because if you look at all the surveys that exist now, they measure benefits, for example. Benefits are very important. Like if you are um, somebody on the parenthood journey and um, you are looking at your benefit of how long is your maternity leave or your paternity leave is important. But what we have found in the surveys that that does not complete their experience. Hmm. What really matters also is how are you treated at work when you come back? Like small things, like do you have a room where you can pump milk? It may seem very simple, but there are lots of places that have six ping pong tables and no room for a new mother to pump milk. And then do you have a place to store the milk or do you have to put it together with people's sandwiches <laughs> in the main refrigerator? This may seem very small things, but at many life moments of an employee's journey, how a company allows them to experience that journey beyond the benefits determines how engaged, loyal, and productive they are. So the Thrive Index is going to measure experiences, not just operational data. And we believe that ultimately experiences are a leading indicator for business success. I mean, I'm on the board of Uber, and let me tell you, if we had the Thrive Index, we would have known there was trouble ahead. Because we would have had um, all this data around burnout, around dissatisfaction, et cetera, on a dashboard for us to see and course correct before they affected business metrics. Ariana, thank you so much for your knowledge and your work. <laughs>